Welcome everybody, and today is a super exciting Lumix Live session. Uh, if this is your first time ever joining one of these streams, uh, these are weekly broadcasts that we do to talk about new technology, cameras, I uh, have interviews with photographers, videographers, you know, our one of our uh, lead kind of tech heads like myself, Matt Fraser, typically joins us sometimes. And uh, yeah, across the board, these are just really fun streams where we can have conversations with all of you. So again, if this is your first time, welcome. Uh, we are incredibly interactive on these streams. So the whole purpose of these is so that you can ask us questions. You can ask uh, fellow creators, photographers, videographers of all levels in the chat. You can also share questions and ask questions from them. Uh, but if you do have a question for us, make sure to tag at Lumix cameras before your question so I can see it pop up on my screen on this side. It makes it easier so that, you know, outside of the side conversations that go on, I can at least be able to address what's happening. Um, let's uh, see here. Uh, so like I said, this is a super, super exciting stream for me. And uh if you've been watching Lumix Live for a while, uh, a lot of this comes down to the fact that, you know, I can actually talk about the GH6 now. I don't have to be super quiet and kind of, you know, just not address the questions of, can you give us more information about the GH6? It's here, it's announced, and we're going to be talking about it a lot over the next, you know, four to six weeks, depending on what goes on with different trade shows and all that kind of fun stuff. So uh, this is going to be so much fun. And to kick things off, this week, uh, I wanted to take a lot of time and actually talk about the photography side of this camera. Uh, I think, obviously, with the launch of the GH6, the vast majority of people and reviewers out there look at this camera through the lens of a filmmaker or a videographer. And that's awesome. That is one of the biggest things that the GH line of cameras has been and probably will always be known for, is the video powerhouse that this camera is. But there's also a ton of users out there, a ton of the people here in this chat that I know I've talked to in the past that really do have a lot of questions about photography and what is Lumix and Panasonic Lumix doing for the photographers out there? What kind of things do, you know, how, how do we update our cameras to better suit this side of the market? And being someone who really does actually focus fairly heavy on the photography side of our products, myself, um, it, this is just like a super exciting time for me. So we're going to cover a whole bunch of stuff. I've got a lot of sample images that I've shot. They're not anything super exciting. They're literally in a box that we're going to be taking a look at in a moment of a color checker, a camera with some lights. Because one of the things people have always been asking about is high ISO performance. How does the image look that way? I've got a couple more, you know, kind of just photographing around with the dog. It's been relatively cold here in Austin, Texas the last couple of days. And with the launch of the product, I wasn't able to get outside on the really nice hot day that we had. Uh, so sample images are a little boring, to say the least. Uh, but these are images that I've been able to run and process through Silky Picks, which is the beta kind of version of, uh, well, at least my version is the beta version that supports some of the raw editing functionality with these cameras. So we can get an actual good feel of what kind of base image you have to work with when you at least just process it out. And in my case, process it out as both a JPEG and then also as a 16-bit TIFF, so I can then put it into things like Lightroom and Photoshop and... Uh, Capture One and all those different programs actually do some more stylistic editing. So the stuff we're going to look at doesn't have any kind of stylistic editing to it. It's literally how I would convert the raw files in a very early stage to then bring into some other programs for my own stylistic editing. So with that, a couple things to get out of the way. Uh, with the GH6, uh, and this is a big tie-in with our Lumix Pro services if you've been following us for a while here, uh, the GH6, at least in the United States, and it's the region that I can speak about uh, from firsthand experience, there is a really big uh, early adopter, uh, pre-order kind of campaign running right now with this camera. If you are pre-ordering the camera, you think that you're pre-ordering the camera, one of the things that we're doing is when you register on LumixGH6.com after you've purchased, uh, we're giving you a Lexar 128GB CF Express card that has been tested, rated, and you know, kind of approved, quote unquote, 
uh, for use with this camera for all of the video functionality, all the stills functionality. Uh, and that's going to be good as long as you get your order in and get your registration done by March 31st. So right around the time that the camera should start shipping here in the United States. Other regions are doing some similar pro uh, promotions during the initial pre-order period. Uh, and then uh, for the most part, you can either get a card. Some countries are doing cash back. Other countries are doing uh, just some other different kind of promotions. So definitely check your local region for Panasonic. I know we have a lot of international viewers here. Check your local region, your local stores, see what they're doing for the promotions there. Uh, but at least here in the United States, uh, it's uh, the free Lexar CF Express Type B uh, memory card is part of the pre-order. And that's like a $200 card if you were to go out and buy it on your own. So, uh, let's see here. And and to start with, that's also because we also fully understand that a lot of people, CF Express cards at $200 a piece for a 128 gig, it's kind of expensive for some users. We want to make sure that you have a seamless way to integrate into this camera and adopt it, uh, especially if you're jumping in early and pre-ordering. So, uh, definitely take a look, uh, get yourself part of that. As I'm seeing with some of the people here, the UK is getting a pretty similar uh, promotion as well. So uh, yeah, it's super exciting. And honestly, these cards alone, I wish we use them in every single one of our cameras. Uh, I'm a big S1R fan when it comes to the full frame line. And I love using my XQD and CF Express media there, uh, mainly because the offload side is so ridiculously fast. But enough of that. The reason I bring this up is that it is also tied in with our Lumix Pro Red service here. Lumix Pro Red is a free service that we offer. Uh, here in the United States, we have two tiers. We have Lumix Pro Red and Lumix Pro Platinum. Lumix Pro Red gets you your extended three-year manufacturer warranty, which comes with just buying a print camera and then registering with the service. Uh, nothing really you need to end up doing other than get yourself registered to take advantage of that. It gets you into our service portal in case you end up having any kind of need to get a camera in for service. But for more professional users or someone who just likes to have much better, you know, kind of peace of mind with your equipment, we have the Platinum tier. Now, this is a paid level service, uh, just like most other, you know, kind of higher end pro protection services or uh, platforms that manufacturers have. And with this Platinum service, you still get that three-year manufacturer warranty, which is the extended one. Uh, you get two-day repairs with next-day shipping both ways, 20% off out of warranty repairs. So that's if you happen to like drop, you know, drop a camera, drop a lens, and break it. You get a discount on the repair there. You also get an exclusive hotline into our service team. So if you happen to have an issue that you need to speak to somebody about, you have a line that you can call us during normal working hours. Uh, and then last but not least, you also get a really cool Peak Design strap that comes with it as a welcome gift. Uh, so if you're someone who's really, you know, like me, really wants to make sure that your equipment is super protected, uh, take a look at Lumix Pro Services. Uh, get yourself at least on the red. It's free. Um, you can always, you know, cancel anytime, all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, but it at least gets you in the platform and you can upgrade through that program at any time you want down the line. So couple other things here. If you are not already doing so, be sure to head over to our Instagram account and give us a follow. We continue these conversations in the uh, direct messages. Uh, so if something comes up, you can always reach out to us there. It's not as fast as doing stuff like, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one or quote-unquote one-on-one -on -one here in the streams. Uh, but it's another way that you can reach out to us uh, and actually have a good conversation with us. We also have a lot of really cool content coming out, uh, specifically also with the GH6. Uh, so definitely go take a look at that. Uh, obviously, on this channel, give us a follow. Like this video if you really like what we've got going on. Um, subscribe. It helps us out tremendously. Um, and I'm going to give everyone a heads up uh, and a nice little slight to Spectrum. Thank you, Spectrum, for your super high quality streaming right now. Uh, for some reason, the bit rates are going all over the place. So hopefully uh, people experience a decent uh, quality stream today. Uh, what else? Um, leading up with the GH6 and its release out into the market, uh, you'll want to make sure that your lenses and uh, firmware updates are all ready to go with the optics. When the GH6 uh, does actually ship, uh, there will be firmware update available for lenses to add uh, more fine-tuned control and better support. Uh, so make sure that as soon as the uh, link is updated that I dropped into the chat, you'll be able to take a look and get your lenses firmware updated before the camera comes out so you're ready to go. 
Um, with that, let's take a look at some of the questions and see uh, what has come in here before we dive into the camera here. Uh, one of the first questions came in from Alan. Since the GH6 can use AF video or AF in video up to 120 frames per second, I'm curious why it doesn't use AF in stills above eight frames per second. Uh, it seems like an artificial limitation, which is disappointing. Uh, so when you look at the way video is processed in a camera versus the way stills are process processed in a camera, there are major differences in the actual pipeline as to how that image is being created. Uh, video is created from JPEGs, uh, basically. Uh, it's processed and then it's, well, that's an oversimplification of it. Uh, video is, is a little bit less demanding when it comes to higher frame rates uh, for things like autofocus and the image quality. Typically, your bit rates are different, your uh, bit depths are different, the encoding process is different. So it's not as easy as just considering the full bit rate or the full autofocus functionality at a given frame rate versus what a still sensor can do. Uh, there's also hardware differences there, mechanical shutters versus a rolling shutter. Uh, so it, it's fairly complicated. It's not an artificial limit. Um, I can tell you that with the way the system's operating at 120 frames per second in video, it uses a different system than what the basic stills uh, side of this uses. So hopefully that is roughly a good enough answer for you. Um, let's dig through here. Uh, I see a whole lot of people uh, really excited about ca the camera and some other cool stuff here. Let's see. Um, Albert would like to know more about the burst modes and the GH6 with strobe compatibility. Yeah, so uh, strobe compatibility on the GH6, um, it's the same uh, flash strobe compatibility that we have with the rest of the Lumix lineup, so the S series and the G series. Uh, so things like Profoto supports there, if you're going to be using their TTL uh, systems. Uh, Godox makes some flashes that are Olympus and Panasonic. It's how they list them is Olympus and Panasonic TTL compatible. Uh, but if you need continuous burst shooting with flash, you do have to pick up one of the, uh, the Lumix uh, flashes. Um, they're tuned properly with the right flash durations to support burst modes in this camera with the way everything's written. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be single shot and burst. And then in electronic shutter, we don't have uh, flash sync compatibility. Uh, let's see here. William, thank you for the kind words, William Turner. Um, Cliff uh, is asking if this is a BSI sensor with onboard AD converters. Um, Cliff, you should know by this point, those are things that I can't answer uh, on a stream like this. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you. Uh, Robbie Noel, uh, why does such a high performing sensor and processor have such slow AFC burst? Is there a frame buffer copy uh, feature saved for G9 Mark II? Um, so that goes back to kind of what I was talking about with the video side of this, the way the shutter mechanisms are, uh, the way that the image is processed, what's going on with how this image is actually being created, all change how fast things can be operating. So, uh, you know, truthfully, the GH6, it isn't the fastest burst shooting camera out there, clearly. Um, we're not going to stand here and tell you that it is, uh, but with the eight frames per second that you can shoot with mechanical, seven frames with electronic, using continuous focus, um, it's it's a it's a relatively solid performer for people that don't need ultra high frame rate shooting for stills. Um, this is one of those areas where when you look from the photography side, not every camera really has to or should do every single thing because then you start to limit what the overall capabilities can be. Uh, you kind of become a jack of all trades, master of none at that point. Um, this camera is an insane image quality out of it, both for photography and video. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the dynamic range boost mode that this camera operates with. So I am going to talk about that a little bit and explain about how it works in the photography side, because it is 100% active in the photography side. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff with processing and how it's actually handling the image off the sensor. Um, that really, really show its its worth in the post-production side of it. So let's see here. Uh, Rhett Thompson, creative video thing is the best thing. Lumix, oh, <laughs> creative video combined set, I think, right, Rhett? 
Uh, yeah, so there's a way in the camera with create a video combined set where you can customize it so that all your photo settings are on one and all your video settings are all decoupled so it all stays separately. It acts like as a true hybrid camera. Uh, let's see, Cliff again, NAB this year? Uh, yep, planning on it, unless the world decides to tell us no again. Um, yeah, we're planning on being at NAB. Um, let's see here, exploring Norway. Um, cool, I guess, thanks for the comment. Um, much appreciated. Uh, let's see here, the real Aaron Collins. Uh, would it be safe to say the GH6 would be better used as an independent filmmaking camera along with an S1H? And are you doing, uh, are you going live with the GH6 right now? Um, I'm not going live with the GH6 right now. I'm using my BS1H, uh, in autofocus for those that care, uh, and those that are always, uh, uh talking about it. So this is our autofocusing system, uh, and the, uh, GH6 is going to be better than this. Uh, so for me, it's awesome in this environment. Uh, but the reason being is I have my GH6 hooked up over here over HDMI so that we can do stuff like this and actually look through the camera. So... Uh, a couple other here. Um, when is the GH6 available in Germany? And can you can you please make the stream rate? Uh, can you please make a stream about video? How much better is it between 10 bit? Uh, we next week's stream will be about video, so we'll come on that. Uh, as far as the German release date of the camera, I don't have that information because I only really work. F I, I I work for the Lumix USA team, so. Uh, it's easier for me to understand and actively know all the U.S. side of the business. Um, William's asking, currently an S5 owner, wondering if an L-mount focal reducer is available to use with the GH6. Uh, probably not. Uh, the flange distances are within 0.5 or 0.75 millimeters, uh, so physically impossible uh, to be mounting back and forth because um, they're also all electronically controlled, so you have to have electronic connections and space for all that, so it doesn't have it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, hey, Sean, I love what Lumix has done with the GH6, but I'd prefer a more compact camera for stills. Any chance of getting a G9 or better, or G90 successor with the sensor, uh, Venus engine, IBIS, of the GH6? I, uh, so, as usual, I can't comment on future product development. Um, I know a lot of people have been asking, you know, you really want an updated version of a camera like a G9 and have, you know, the tech that we're putting in this. Something to remember, though, is that any new technology and processing requires new hardware and the harder and harder cameras are getting pushed these days, the larger the cameras have to get to maintain reliability. One of the reasons the GH6 has a cooling fan is because of things like the CF Express cards, the new Venus engine, uh, the processor, which or the sensor, which puts out more heat. All these things have to be managed to where a camera can be reliable. So certain levels of technology are definitely possible to scale down, but you need to look at what is realistic with technology and how far things get pushed versus what our pipe pipe uh, dreams are for this. I'd love to, and I, I'm one of those people that agrees with a lot in the forum, I'd love to have a camera like a GM series come back. But the truth is that camera was ridiculously small and you have no space to properly dissipate heat, which heat is an enemy of an image quality. The hotter a camera gets, the worse the image quality gets. Um, stabilization systems, you got to do a lot to be able to size things like that down. Uh, processors, which again, generate heat, memory cards, all of these things combine into what allow you to be able to make a camera a certain size. As it is, the GH6 was designed to be as small as possible with the cooling system that we've got. Any smaller than this and you start running into a lot of thermal problems uh, to where even, you know, if you're just using the camera, you could be caught, you know, you're generating heat, going through menus, uh, taking photographs, jumping back and forth between video. You, all of those things generate heat because the camera's got to operate. Um, smaller cameras probably won't be able to do half the things that modern cameras can do as they get smaller, um, especially with the image quality improvements that have happened over the years. Uh, let's see here. Uh... Not trying to be a downer uh, on that uh, question there. Um, I, like I said, I, I, I'd love to have some other stuff. It's just, it's it's modern technology. At some point, you do hit limits as to what's possible versus what is realistic for a reliable product. Uh, let's see. Um... Uh, 
Will the GH6 handheld 100 megapixel high resolution mode work with other lenses like the 12 to 35 and 35 to 100, not version 2? Yes, handheld high resolution mode works with pretty much any of our lenses. You don't really need to, it's not limited by what optics you put on it. Um, we don't really ever do that. Uh, the only time, the only feature I know that gets limited based on the lens is the linear focus control or linear manual focus control. Uh, and that's strictly because it depends on if the lens has the proper hardware to provide the information, the positional data. Um, and that's a hardware thing. So you run into, if the hardware doesn't support it, you can't just magically make it happen. Uh, handheld high resolution shot. I've done it with a 15 millimeter which has no image stabilization. Uh, and I'm gonna actually show a sample of that that I've processed both uh, the standard 25 megapixel and the handheld high resolution shot mode. Um, it's a selfie, so, you know, we'll kind of have to just deal with that a little bit. Uh, let's see here. Uh, could you expand in general, uh, if in general on Panasonic when waiting to do further grade, when wanting to do further grades on natural profile is lowering contrast in camera a good idea or a bad idea? We're going to save an answer like that for next week. That's in the video sides of the conversation. Uh, great things. I can't comment on future product developments. Uh, Nick, how much brighter is the screen versus the G9 screen? Uh, it's definitely brighter. Um, yeah, it's it, it's definitely brighter than, than the G9 screen. It's using a screen similar to what's on the GH5 Mark II, I believe. I have to look at all the specs. It's been a whirlwind of a week. Cool. All right, so that goes through all those questions. Let's actually get into the things that everyone wants to see, and that's actually with the camera. So I figured one of the first things that we'll take a look at is the shooting setup that I've got. And I'm sorry that I'm looking away from camera. Um, I'm still trying to find the best way to, like, organize all my monitors. Those that have watched our previous stream about multicam operation and remote control, you've seen what my desk looks like and the four monitors that I have here plus the one that's up here, it's hard to figure out exactly where I want because I like my big main screen. But uh, let's actually take a look through the screen of the GH6. So this is one of the screens, uh, one of the setups that I like doing some basic testing in here. Uh, it's just a simple black box that I tape together. Uh, and then I light it and throw a color checker and stuff like that in there so that I can create um, different sample images, uh, adjust things, do some product photography with it, play around with the different modes in a more, you know, kind of confined area. Uh, but the reason I want to show you this is because I want to actually start looking, uh, to start with, um, I actually want to show you guys the image quality that this camera gets, and then we'll talk about the actual specs and some of the stuff that is behind the scenes and how this works. So, Right now, I've just got uh, my Windows uh, image viewer pulled up here, and we're going to go through, I've done a whole bunch of ISO ramps on this camera, and every image that we're looking at has been processed from RAW. So this is the RAW still image that's been thrown into Silky Pix, uh, a beta version of it, so this is still early. Um, so we're going to put that caveat here. This is still beta RAW processing of this. Uh, but this is what I would be doing with my images from RAW when I want to start bringing them into, like I said at the beginning, something like Lightroom or Premiere, or I'm starting to play around with programs like Luminaire Neo and all those other kinds of things. I know a lot of people are starting to see ads and stuff from those companies. Um, I got bit by one, so I decided to purchase it and play around with it. So just to start with, we start taking a look at this. So this is 100 ISO. So this is shot in this box. I've got two aperture MC lights at 6,000 Kelvin, um, just creating a little bit of a, a lighting ratio here. And what you can see is that, and this is zooming into 100% on a 1440p monitor. So this won't give you the best look, but um, just some, some ideas here. So at 100 ISO, super clean. I think everyone expects 100 ISO is going to be super clean you know, little to no noise whatsoever in an image like this. And then as we start to go up, we'll take a look at 200. Uh, let's actually jump up to 800 where you start actually getting into where improvements you'd start to see what happen are. So at 800 ISO, we're taking a look here, you know, across the frame. It's sharp. There's still a ton of detail, very little noise in any of the chips on here, even into the shadow regions on the lens here. Super low noise, even in this product. Um, and this is with all noise reduction for uh, luminance noise 
totally turned off in the the software because I handle noise reduction later in different software if I'm ever going to add it. So you're seeing basically about as raw as you can get from the image converted over to JPEGs here. So now we go up to, let's jump up to 3200 ISO. It's an ISO that I know a lot of people typically ended up trying to not really want to use on Micro Four Thirds. So as we can see here, this is 3200 ISO with, you know, fairly common light as to how I would be shooting if I need to keep my shutter speeds up. So shadow noise is very well controlled. Detail is kept all the way across the frame. You start seeing a little bit of noise show up in the midtones here, a little bit in the, the shadow regions if we compare that to when we drop down to, say, 800 ISO. So a little bit more noise in the shadow regions, but detail is all still there. So now let's go to, like, something crazy. Let's go to 12,800 ISO out of this camera. So now we're looking at 12,800 ISO processed with no luminance noise reduction from the raw file output as a JPEG. It is ridiculous how clean this sensor actually is to the point where I am 100% comfortable using 12,800 ISO for still shooting when I need to keep my shutter speed up. Now, Everyone tends to get like super tied into ultra dark room shooting in stills. And I don't typically ever test a camera that way, but I do have some tests here to show you that where it's really low light levels, uh, ambient light levels to kind of really push what the shadows do. Um, but even in this case, I mean, the amount of detail that you're still pulling in from this camera at 12,800 ISO is insane even down into the amount of detail that's coming in on the actual kind of textured part of the color checker here and then we'll go one more up to 25,600 again yeah you're getting noise in here you're starting to get um just some of that that general film like grain into this is a better way that i like to describe it uh and these are all shot with the uh 12 to 60 millimeter f 2.8 to f4 so this is the kit lens that you're getting with it um, it's, it's an, it's an insanely clean image to work with and throwing it through modern software, should you need to shoot at these high ISOs can definitely bring it even further to that next level. Uh, but now let me just move my water bottle so I can actually see my other screen here. Uh, let's take a look at like a really low light scenario. So this is just ambient light in my studio here. This is if I have the main lights turned off up here and I'm only running the red and blue lights. So not a great color accurate scene but again 100 iso super clean nice detail everything's there not really any kind of noise or shadow information run here then let's go up to 1600 iso again available light 1600 iso we start looking at the uh, details here in the peak design little strap piece you're still getting all of that detail at 1600 ISO when you're working with the raw files here. I don't know how great this comes through on the compression. We're trying to run this with uh, 1440p and higher bit rates. So hopefully things are coming through cool. Um, I'll work on seeing if I can get these posted somewhere as well so people can see them maybe a little bit better. But then we go to, let's say, 6400 ISO in low light shooting. Low light shooting, again, you're getting that noise that does, you know, kind of post up through the frame you do get some of that no matter what when you start going up in higher isos but that detail is still there in the strap lug here so 6400 for me 100 percent perfectly usable in an environment like this and then we go up to say 25,600. so the maximum iso that you can shoot on this again yeah, you're getting noise in the shadows, but the detail here is still fairly well uh, retained. It's still usable for me, uh, perfectly fine for me. I would probably cap out in an ultra low light scenario at about 12,800 for me to shoot with here. And as you can see, again, this is dark, dark room 12,800. So what does this actually do when you start going into, you know, kind of a more realistic scenario, not shooting test charts? Well... Here's 12,800 ISO of my pup. He's been so ridiculously patient with me photographing him. So we take a look, 12,800 ISO. Again, this is raw processed out, no luminance noise uh, reduction, none of that stuff. Uh, and then just kicked out as a JPEG so I can quickly throw it up on screen here. The amount of detail that is still being held 
in the shadow regions here in an image where, you know, to actually get a good hand holdable shutter speed to where I'm used to is insane to me at 12,800 ISO. I will use this all day long, every single day and have no problem working with it because the noise and the kind of grain pattern that shows up to it is so natural looking compared to what you have in older style sensors or older resolution sensors. And it, then, I mean, honestly, even at 25,600 ISO, I'm still perfectly comfortable using this on real world scenarios. Um, and let's see here. I think Albert asks, which lens was this shot for the dog? This is the 42.5 Noctocron. So this is like my favorite lens. I'm so stoked to be able to come back and start using this lens again in micro four thirds. But yeah, the amount of detail that you still have in the eyes, the edge details that's being kept, the fur in the shadow region still being able to be made out. It is crazy how much this, uh, this sensor and this processor is able to produce. So all of that's to show, I mean, like, you know, that's great. We all look at, at dynamic range tests and noise tests. We look at all this stuff and it's usually always of boring, you know, kind of boring subjects. You know, we're looking at test charts. That doesn't really give you an indication of real world shooting and scenarios. The last two shots, I would say, would be much more of a realistic, real world shooting scenario as to how I would be working with this camera. And as that disclaimer, I'm not saying that everyone's going to be getting the same exact experience as I am. You know, obviously, I have a lot of experience working with our cameras. It takes a little bit of time to get yourself comfortable with a camera, any any camera that you get, especially when you get into a new one. But the potential and the capability is available with this camera. And the raw files speak praises for what this sensor is able to produce. And a lot of that is into the technology that actually creates the image here. So I mentioned about that dual or that dynamic range boost mode. I have to make, I have to be careful not saying dual native ISO because that's the other system. These are two separate systems. So Dynamic range boost mode in the GH6 is available in the video side. It's a toggle on and off. So you, you pick when you want to use it. In the photography mode, it's done automatically in the background as it scans an image and as, it, as it's creating the process, it knows when it should run this and when it shouldn't run it. What it does is it takes the image or the frame. So the, once you click the shutter, it is instantaneously running that image through two separate conver uh, converters or two separate circuits. One is a high uh, saturation circuit and one is a low noise circuit. The high saturation circuit is what's going to get you really good highlight retention, highlight detail and dynamic range, and also that upper mid tone detail in an image. The low noise circuit is typically going to have lower dynamic range, but its job is to give you more detail and cleaner looking shadow regions as well as the lower part of the mid range. And what it does instantaneously, so it's one image, it processes them both at the same time simultaneously. And then the Venus engine puts them together and takes the best out of both of them to output your image. And it does this for RAW and for JPEGs. Then the camera will then run its, you know, its JPEG processing for the in-camera, for some people's tastes, shooting JPEGs great and you like the way the JPEGs look. Others, like myself, I'm always a raw shooter when it comes to cameras. Uh, so I prefer shooting and then editing in post. It's just, it's something I enjoy doing. Uh, but it does all of this in the background. So it just, it makes it such a solid tool for filmmakers and for photographers because you don't have to really do anything to do any of this stuff and you get such an improvement in things like low ISO shooting or high ISO, I mean, low light shooting and high ISO shooting. Um, one of the things where you would really see this come into play was touched upon in some of the reviews that have gone out online. When you shoot with a sensor like this, that's running this uh, dynamic range boost, or at least what we're doing with it, what you get is more highlight detail that you can pull out of your images, which is roughly about a stop more highlight detail. So that means that if you happen to have a shot that may be a little overexposed in the highlights for stills, you're gonna have more range to pull that those highlights back in the raw file. And in the shadow region, it's gonna produce a cleaner looking and more detailed shadow region 
especially for the raw files. So when you start getting up into those higher ISOs, like I was showing, that that um, ultra high 12,800 ISO, like if I go back... Sorry, I went to the wrong, wrong scene. If I go back and look here and we go to that 12,800 ISO image, the detail in the shadow regions at these ultra high ISOs are well maintained in ways that a traditional sensor circuitry just can't do because it's a, it's a gain approach across the entire range. This camera is taking multiple images to put it there. It's so awesome. And it's one of those things that I can't wait to see what other photographers do with this um, because it's, it's just so much fun to shoot with. I don't know if I'm being like super excited about this or if my voice or enthusiasm's coming across. Uh, those that have watched these before know that I get a little excited about things. Um, but let's let's take a look at some of the, the questions here. Uh, I saw a bunch of questions come in through here. So um, Cliff was asking, USB PD watt rating, 18 watts or is more needed? I, the, the better way to define what what you need for this camera for USB-C power delivery and charging is anything that actually states USB PD compliant. So that means that it's a device like this. Uh, it's a, this is a 10,000 milliamp hour RAV power that I picked up off uh, one of the online marketplaces. Uh, as long as it states that it's power delivery spec and that it offers the 9 volt 3 amp set, uh, kind of mode, that's what you need to make sure that you can power deliver and charge the battery simultaneously. Uh, the other options that are out there, so the lower wattage, the lower volt, or uh, the lower amperage that you can get in some of the other ones, those will let you charge the camera. We don't lock you out of using those other chargers. You can, of course, use them, but you won't be able to charge the battery simultaneously. So just make sure that whatever external power source you want to go with for USB, Make sure that it states that it supports 9 volt 3 amp, and then you'll be perfectly fine with it. Uh, I think that correlates to 27 watt or something like that. Uh, but yeah, just make sure that it has to say that it supports tw uh, 9 volt 3 amp. Uh, let's see here. Uh, William says, love the skin on that camera in the image. I have carbon fiber skin on my <laughs> S5. Yeah, that's, uh, that's one because I have two S1Hs here. I want to make sure I know which one's my full spectrum converted camera. Uh, it's just easier for me. Uh, yeah, I like it. Um, with the G9, I always use the original RW2 files directly into Lightroom. What am I doing wrong? Why go through a TIFF export first if Lightroom can read the RW2 files? Really good question, Nick. Um, this, is, this is just a process that I have to do and people typically will do before formal support for the raw files comes out in ACR or Lightroom. Uh, once Lightroom support is fully there, it, I don't use the Silky Picks program anymore. I just put them into Lightroom or Capture One or whatever program I'm using at the time. Uh, this is just because it's before the camera's released publicly and Adobe hasn't added their the support for the updated RW2 files from the GH6. Um, yeah, so sorry if that was confusing with what I was saying here. Uh, let's see here. Uh... FC is asking, will dynamic range boost uh, use lens to fill light reflect shadows in Photoshop? Uh, so that's not really how that kind of system works. Uh, if you've got like flares and stuff like that, it, that's a different, that's before the, the DR boost is actually processed. That's actually in the, the, on the sensor side where it's gaining the light and filling the photodiodes. After that, that's where it starts to use the the um, uh, DR boost mode is after that. So it's whatever the sensor picks up to fill the well, that's what then gets put into the DR boost functionality. So, uh, yeah, Cliff, yeah. So 9 volt, 3 amp, 27 watt. It, with PD, it gets a little weird because you have to make sure that it supports the 9 volt, 3 amp specification specifically. Not all devices do. They'll pick a couple of different ones. Um, so that's just one of the things that you have to look at a little bit with it. The vast majority of them will do it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Tara asks, what is the burst rate in RAW when shooting in manual focus? 
Uh, manual focus, you can go up to 14 frames per second with mechanical, or you can use the uh, electronic shutter up to 75 frames per second to get the fastest frame, and that has a 200 frame buffer. Uh, if you drop it to uh, SH60, which is the, it's one step down, SH60 allows the system to use the dynamic range boost mode in the still side as well. Anything over 60 frames per second and DR boost doesn't work um, because it's just inherent of the, the technology. So that's why there's an SH60 mode and then there's an SH75 in case you just want the fastest burst that you can do. But you get a, a 200 shot uh, buffer for that mode. Uh, let's see here. All right, let's actually look at some of the cool stuff on the camera now. So, like I said, I got the camera set up here, obviously to show you the settings here, but I want to show you some of the other cool stills functionality that this camera has. So, one of the first things and the highlight feature that a lot of people talk about is the high-resolution shot mode. Excuse me. High-resolution shot mode that's available on this camera. Now, the way you get to this is on the GH6. It is in the top mode dial for this now, so it replaces 4K, 6K photo and post focus, which unfortunately in this camera are not on the camera anymore. So you have a direct access into high resolution mode. Once you're into that, when you press the menu button, you'll see that in the photography option here, or the cam main camera mode, you have high resolution mode settings. So when I click in here, this is where I can toggle things like handheld on or off. If I actually go in and do it, I can turn it on or off. I have the ability for picture quality here. So if you set it to combined, it will use whatever your RAW plus JPEG settings are in normal shooting. Uh, I typically leave it there. Um, it's just the way I work. Picture size in this case, it's going to be up to 100 megapixels, or it's going to be 100 megapixels in this case because that's what it shoots. It doesn't show it here because I have the HDMI attached. Uh, you also have the ability to simultaneously record a 25 megapixel image at the same time. So you'll get your 100 megapixel high resolution shot as well as a 25 megapixel. And then you have shutter delay. So if you want to actually be adding a delay because you don't have, say you're working on a tripod and you don't have a cable release, you can put a shutter delay on it. If you're doing handheld high resolution mode, turn the delay off. Uh, at least that's what I do. And this is going to produce a 100, mega, uh, 100 megapixel image for you. Now in handheld high resolution shot, it's taking 16 images to create this for you. Uh, and it outputs them in anywhere between, my testing is anywhere between 11 to 16 seconds. The reason it's between 11 to 16 seconds all depends on how much motion is in the image, uh, at least in my testing. So if you're taking a shot that has a ton of motion and it has to do a lot of the algorithmic corrections for uh, motion correction in the image, it'll take a little bit longer. I mean, you're processing a 100 megapixel image in camera with the processor. Um, so that's kind of the longest that you can run. The other option that you have with this camera is going in to do non-handheld high resolution. Now, non-handheld high resolution mode is still a 100 megapixel image, but this lets you turn things like motion blur uh, detection on or off. So if you want to have the effect of motion blur, you can have it set it to mode one and it will let the motion blur show. Mode two will process it out to where it will uh, remove that motion and use the one of the frames to create the, the proper still motion out of it. You still have that picture quality setting, that simultaneously record shot, and it just lets you actually have a little bit more control. The tripod high resolution shot mode is done from eight images. So you get eight images captured uh, to create the one image out of it and takes a little bit shorter. It's about seven seconds from my testing, whether I have motion correction on or off. But motion correction, again, depending on how much is going on in the scene, that could lengthen the amount of time that it takes for the image to process. Uh, so let's see here. Uh, what other questions do we got? Uh, I know this might not be possible to add in firmware upgrade, but can you suggest to Panasonic for a future camera to consider 1080p, what, 480 
or 960. Uh, we can suggest it. I don't think it can do it in firmware. Uh, we have up to 300 frames per second in variable frame rate, which is 10-bit anyway. So uh, let's see here. Um, thank you for the info. This is from F High Tech. Uh, thank you for the info. I still work with a GH4. What's the difference with GH4 and GH6 in the photo specs? biggest high-end spec is you're going from 16 megapixel to 25 megapixel and you're using an infinitely newer processor uh, and sensor tech that will produce infinitely cleaner and better looking stills out of it. Um, that's that's like the main highlight things here. Yeah, the GH6 is a little bit bigger um, than the GH4 and the GH5, uh, but also I think ergonomics wise, it's way better than any of the other cameras. I also argue that the GH6 is way more comfortable to shoot with than the G9, and I like the G9. I don't shoot with it enough anymore, uh, but I think it's a way better laid out camera and ergonomically designed camera than the G9 was. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Mike's perspective, where can I get one of those Lumix shirts? Um, we used to give them away at trade shows when we had trade shows, uh, so if we ever have trade shows again, maybe we'll have shirts. I don't really know. Uh, Cliff asks, when will we get a GH6 battery grip? Uh, there is no battery grip for the GH6, um, and you can't get a battery grip for the GH6. There's no contacts on it. Um, that was one of the things that was a, a design choice with the, the GH6. Um, a lot of people do like battery grips. Um, I'm one of them in some cases. I, I will use a battery grip on my S1R, uh, but ultimately the GH6, especially with you know, different adapters and cages and stuff like that have made it where the tripod or the, um, the tripod mounting can be done with an L bracket. Uh, and it, no matter what I say here, it's going to sound like an excuse to, to half the people, um, that are watching, but truthfully, it, it just doesn't have one. Um, I know that some people are going to be really annoyed with that and, and sorry. Uh, but as far as power goes, these things are a heck of a lot cheaper and USB-C provides a better way to power because you still have the battery in the camera. This can be plugged on and off and you don't have to have the grip there. For vertical shooters, I can 100% understand some of the um, the concern there with not having a vertical grip. Um, but yeah, it just doesn't have one. So let's see here. Um, Tara, just want to say <laughs> happy about supporting SSDs. Yep, that is coming in the firmware update. Uh, let's see here. Martin asks, is there a, uh, is there a focus distance value? I mean, number, not just the bar with three digits, uh, as on the GH5 Mark II. So let's jump back over and look at the GH5 or the GH6. So with the GH6, we do have, if I punch in, say for manual focus here, when I punch in for manual focus, you'll see that we actually get the distance scale in feet in this case, or in meters, you can change it to meters or feet and you do get the actual readout of distances here. Now, <clears throat> this is the perfect segue to talk about probably one of the coolest features that I think this camera offers. And that's when I go into the menu settings, let me put this back to standard photo mode, and I go down in here to autofocus. In the focus menu, we have a new menu option here called focus limiter. So focus limiter, what this does, when I come in here and I go to set, this allows me to come in here, manually focus to a certain range to say, hey, you know, this is about as close as I want. I can now click here and say, I want my limit one to be here, but then I wanna zoom out or focus out to only here, and I wanna set my second limit to here. Now, when that is enabled, and turned on, the camera now for focus is going to be looking at only that range to be gaining focus. Uh, this is going to be awesome for uh, users that work with lenses that maybe don't have uh, an actual physical focus limit switch on them. So if you know that you're always focusing out at a far distance, set focus limiter, find the range that you want to focus on, and then it'll only use that range to be able to find focus in. This can be used for both photo and for video modes. So it, it doesn't matter which option you use. This lets you customize that. And then when you're actually in this mode and you have it enabled, 
you'll see that you have a new little icon under the AFS uh, setting up here that says that you have a limiter turned on. So you have this really cool tool available now uh, on the GH6 with any lens that you want to actually limit there. So it's awesome. Uh, let's see here. Um, the chicks, uh, good to know about the ergonomics versus the G9. Could you comment on the GH6 ergonomics and feel when it comes to back button focus configurations? Very important for me. Yes, I can. Um, so back button focus users are probably going to be really happy with the way this camera's set up. Um, I can probably do this. I'll take my, uh, GH6 off the tripod here. Uh, turn it off. So one of the cool things that we changed with this camera is when we look at the back here and we'll set it up. Oh, wait, there's the settings. Cool. Uh, so when we, when we start working with the, the GH6, so you'll see that the front of the camera, we've made some major changes here. So some pointed out, you have the red button on the back here. I'm trying to get this into the light a little bit better. So we have the record button in the back there. And then on the back of the camera, you'll see that we've actually shifted where the joystick is and where the AF on button are. So now that they sit a little bit closer to where your hand is going to be holding on to the camera to give you a little bit better actual kind of control as to what buttons you're pressing. Um, the other cameras, the AF on button was positioned a little bit further away. Uh, so I know some users didn't really like the way that was positioned. Uh, but this one, this one has been uh, improved a lot. I honestly think that uh, anyone that shoots with back button focus is going to like the way this one is set up. As I talk away from the microphone, sorry everybody. Uh, I think everyone's going to like the way it's set up uh, on the GH6, especially if you're back button focusing. So, let us see here. Um... Uh, where were the questions here? Uh, with distance scale, I didn't see the actual value of the focus distance, just reference markers on the line. Y yeah, so it's telling you where the distance is. Um, if you're talking about like a real readout, like a range finder readout, um, I don't know any camera that does an actual range finding readout of what the distance is. Um, this lets you just know that that's the distance you want to focus to, and there it is on the scale. Um, uh, pre-ordered three of them yesterday. Question, what would be the best or correct way to synchronize the shutter on two cameras? Be mount via control cable between them? Um, depends. Are you talking about in photography? In photography, um, you might be able to rig something up that gives you a remote and then gives you three 2.5 millimeter out and then you can plug them in and trigger it once. You might be able to do that, but I think that'd be a custom cable and you have to be careful when you wire up cables like that. Um, but yeah, uh, let's see here. Uh, Martin says, yes, the focus limiter was the second feature I really wanted, but I want to see a value, not just a bar that moves between two numbers. I, I think I understand what you're saying. You want to be able to go in and actually say this distance and this distance and have it. Um, th this does effectively the same thing. Um, it's just a readout in a different way, but um, I can pass that information over Martin so that you can, our team can, you know, kind of take it in uh, with what they can. But I don't think because cameras don't have range finding in them, like they don't have a way to tell you exactly what the distance is to my knowledge. Uh, that might be something that isn't possible with existing setups. Uh, let's see here. Um, video crop factors, 4K 101 pixel and 1080 101. How much, uh, how much reach can I get in 300 millimeter telephoto? I, Cliff, video questions are going to be for next week because I actually have to dig a lot more information into the video stuff. So if you join us next week, I'll, I'll try to get you an answer for that one. Um, Let's see here. In high resolution shot, what is the extent of the handheld movement in your trees, birds, improvement with the GH6 compared to the G9? Uh, well, to start with, uh, the G9 didn't have support for uh, handheld high resolution shot uh, in this case. Uh, but as far as the 
high resolution, like the actual high resolution shot, it is definitely improved. It has a much better way to work with uh, motion. And let me pull up my high resolution shot modes for you. So, see if I did this right. Yes. So, we are going to go back to this screen. There we go. So, like I said, everybody, it's a selfie. I'm sorry. So, this is held uh, at arm's length <clears throat> using handheld high-resolution shot mode, uh, standing out in front of the Capitol here down in uh, Texas, and using the 15, excuse me, the 15 millimeter uh, Sumalux, so tiny little lens. This shot right here is the standard 25 megapixel image. So you can see it's focused on my eyes behind my glasses right here. The beard is nice and sharp. The background, the blur between, you know, the, just the motion that would happen in the, the bokeh in the background. Very well controlled for a standard 15 uh, millimeter field of view. But then when we look at the handheld high resolution shot mode, so this is handheld high resolution shot at arm's length with my leather jacket on after standing out in the heat trying to hold the camera steady this goes into zoom in closer here this is the stitched handheld high resolution shot at 100 megapixels how much detail you're actually still getting here even down into the backpack strap from my peak design bag the detail that you can get into this. I don't know if the YouTube stream is going to be crushing it, but ultimately the biggest thing that I've noticed with the way this system works is that unlike the previous kinds of iterations of handheld high resolution shot, you are getting usable solid resolution increases in the newer mode. So it is... It is probably one of the first cameras that I would actually use handheld high resolution shot to get 100 megapixels in normal shooting environments. Now, ultra fast moving, you know, like race cars, stuff like that. I, I don't think it's practical to use a handheld high res mode from any camera in any manufacturer when you have that level of motion. But if I'm doing landscape work, if I'm doing portrait work. I, we've been playing around with the portrait work a lot with this camera. Portrait work, I think, is ridiculously solid for this. Uh, and then when we look at outside of, you know, a kind of bogus selfie here, we can look at, cue this up properly for everybody. We can take a look at more of a landscape style shot. So this is handheld this is handheld high resolution shot mode versus using the um, standard 25 megapixel shot. So this is standard 100 ISO. You'll see, you know, you get some good detail across the board, really nice rich colors. This is just a raw converted over to JPEG, nothing done to the colors in the camera, nothing done to the noise reduction in the camera, none of that. Uh, and this is with the 15 millimeter F uh, 1.7 Sumalux that we have. Lens that I have tattooed on my arm. Uh, so this is this is just raw converted over to a JPEG using Silky Pix, and you see you get tons of detail here, even in the 25 megapixel image. Lots of nice detail. It was a not a crazy windy day, but it was a windy enough day that the branches were moving. And again, this is 25 megapixel. Now, if I back out and we take a look at the 100 megapixel, this is 100 megapixels handheld high resolution shot mode from the GH6. We start punching in even closer here. And you'll see how it handles motion of trees, how it handles busy motion here, like in the branches here in, the, in front of the Capitol building, how it's handling detail if we go up to lighter leaves that would be moving. This camera with the motion correction for handheld high resolution shot is, in my opinion, mind blowing. I am just so excited about how this works and how much detail I can pull out of an image. So even if I take and say, all right, so this is the handheld high res shot. We'll take the standard, high, uh, the standard 25 megapixel image and we'll get them roughly into the same spot here. 
So let's go and take a look at the actual main dome on the Capitol. So if we look here, punched in to roughly the same positioning here. So you'll see the 100 megapixel handheld high res. I only have to go to about, in this case, I mean, realistically, you'd go to, I think it's like 85% will get you the, the comparable. But the amount of detail, the biggest thing that you see here is how much cleaner the handheld high res shot looks. A lot less noise because you're, you're combining multiple images to create that. So you're going to get the benefit of a cleaner looking image. Even when you start going into some of the more shadow details, you have more shadow information and cleaner looking shadows on the handheld high res. You have more detail when you're looking at things like the, uh, the crests on the front of the building here. It is crazy how good the detail is. And even stuff like, because you're recording more resolution, the amount of detail that you get in the branches here versus the branches here in the standard 25 megapixel image. It is, it is just a powerhouse of a tool for photographers. So, let's see here. Uh, what else do we do we have here? Some of the other cool things with this camera for feet, uh, for the photographers out there. Uh, let's go to my camera angle. So one of the other cool things that you can see here is that uh, with the way the system works for photography and for videography, you have detection subject options now. So you have human, which is face, eye, head, and body detection all together. Then you have face and eye, and then you have human and animal. So we've broken this out into three different modes now, particularly because there are certain times where you want face and eye detection, but you don't want body detection. You want it set so that if you're using face and eye and it loses a face, or you put something that covers the face, you want it to revert to the mode that you would normally be using outside of that. And where this comes into play is, so if I set this up to face and eye, come back out to the main shooting mode, and then click into the focus modes, you'll see that unlike the previous iterations of the way our detection systems worked, you don't have to go to the full, uh, full area AF settings to get face and eye. You can use it in the zone area modes, you can use it in the, the new zone operation mode here, even into the single point areas. So what this means is that, like previous cameras, one of the things that would be an issue for some users was that when I'd be shooting a, a still or a portrait of somebody with face and eye detection, and it would either the face got blocked or you would want to try to focus on something else, it would revert to the full area focus mode, which is going to look at the entire scene, grab the first contrast area, and that's what it's going to try to focus on because you're not giving it any information or focus area of, hey, this is what I want you to be looking at. With the new system, I can have the camera set up to, as I go back to this, what I like to do is I have the camera set up to my zone which now also gives me a new look to the zone area. So if we look at the way the zone box looks, it's not a whole bunch of images anymore. It's a resizable actual like kind of bracket area. So I can have this bracket moving around wherever I want it to go. And as long if there's a face or an eye detected within the bounds or right at the edge of the bound of that, that's when it will enable the face and eye detection. When it has no face and eye, it will only use that area to be grabbing the focus for it. So this is like that big shift in, as you start to use the, the GH6 or the modern Lumix cameras, there's a ton of things that you can do for the focus that don't force the camera to just kind of guess what you want it to focus on. You can use all these detection modes in whatever custom area you want. Um, I like to call that kind of zone and face and eye detection mode, like, and I, I'm sure this is going to tick off some people. I like to call it more as like a kind of like product presentation or like a YouTuber mode. I use it a lot when I'm doing the training videos and stuff. I'll have the zone area set somewhere like right here in my frame with face and eye detection turned on so that my face will be the priority. 
But then if I take something and say, hold it up to the, in that box area to where it makes my face, dis it loses the face area and it now looks on here, that's where it now focuses and it doesn't have to guess what I'm trying to tell it to focus on. It's such a nice addition for this setup and it's so much fun to use. Uh, and little things like that have made the usability infinitely greater in the photography side. Um, look at some of the questions here. Cliff asks, Photo Raw, is it 14-bit or 12-bit? Um, it's in a 16-bit container uh, are what the raw files are when you're using the uh, any of the modes that use dynamic range boost, which is basically anything under 60 frames, 60 frames per second and under. Uh, so you're getting a 16-bit uh, container for it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, always been proud of uh, proud of and satisfied with the Ibis and the GH series. Yeah, and this takes it to a whole nother level. The stabilization in the GH6 is seven and a half stops for the in-body stabilizer. So any lens that you put on this is going to support seven and a half stops. And it's been tuned for the ultra wide angle stabilization as well. So this really comes in more into the video side, which we'll talk about next week. Uh, typically, in-body stabilizers can cause edge warping depending on how aggressive they are. And the more aggressive the stabilizer gets, the more likely you can see edge warping. Uh, the new ultra high precision gyro that we're using and the new algorithm that we've written for this really minimize any of that edge warping that you'd see with ultra wide angle lenses. It's a consistent experience of stabilization, whether you're using the body stabilizer or a dual IS2 lens out to like 280 millimeter. It is crazy how stable this camera is. And everyone thought the GH5 was a pretty solid camera to begin with. This is even better than that. Uh, let's see here. Um, FC asks, just curious, is single area now octagon instead of a rectangle square? Uh, no, so single area AF on this camera, uh, if I go in here and I change it to say one area, uh, one area is still just the box, so you have a, a regular box that you can shoot with. Then we also have one area plus, which gives you a box with an external region uh, to work with. So your primary is the box in the middle. I'll move this to where you can kind of maybe see it a little bit better. So your box is what's primarily in the middle, and then it uses the external area of that as kind of like a supporting region uh, for the one area focus. Uh, you also have the group or a zone detection, which I now I'm pretty much just using the zone region for 90% of the things that I shoot. This will use any of the AF points within this box or within this octagon or what is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, eight. Yeah, eight um, in this <laughs> in this box. Um, but it's also sizable. So I can make it a much wider area. I can make it a, you know, more of a true octagon here. Um, and then I can pair all of these with the face and eye detection or the animal detection, or I can turn it off and just use those modes if I want. So it's really designed to be that customizable. In addition to it, um, this is probably one of the things that, that gets most overlooked and I think has the least amount of understanding as to how our system works. In the photography side, we've shown these before, and I've dropped a link into the chat in the past. We have an, an entire AF guidebook for both photography and videography with this camera. And the reason we have this is that there is a ton of user control over the autofocus system. Most of the time, as I, again, I'm covering my microphone before I'm speaking, most of the time... When you first pick up a camera, you may be looking and you go to do certain styles of shooting and the focusing system may not be 100% what you want it to be. Well, that part of that's because we have the ability to tune to basically an, a, a crazy amount of detail, how much sensitivity you want in the focusing, how fast you want it to be looking for area changes, and how aggressive you want the motion prediction, excuse me, prediction to be. Now, by default, the camera ships as set one, which is a motion prediction set plus one, and then everything else is zeroed out. But we've updated this mode for continuous AF shooters to include different tuned settings. And now we're adding kind of examples as to like what, what these modes were tuned for. So like set two 
is tuned for objects that move in one direction at a consistent speed. So things like trains, airplanes, cars, uh, like a, a, I use cars as like a drag strip. They're going to be coming down in one direction. They're not really going to be, at least they shouldn't be, moving around and erratically changing direction. It has one consistent speed. So this is tuned more for that style of shooting. Set two, or actually set three, is tuned for more random mo movement. So what we say here is suggested when the subject moves randomly and other objects may also still be in this, in this, the uh, scene. So in this example, we use things like football, basketball, soccer, f you know, football in Europe. Uh, this is tuned more for that particular style of, sh of shooting. And you'll notice that each of these adjust how sensitivity is set up, how area switching is set up, and how the motion prediction is set up. So you have these different presets. And then set four, which is the one that I use often when I'm going to be photographing my dog playing like in the park. If we bring him out and you know we're playing catch, they don't pick a consistent speed. They don't pick a consistent direction. They could be running around all over the place, right? So that's where I use set four. This is when a situation comes up where the speed of the subject changes significantly and the direction can be changing significantly. So the, my dog starting from a dead stop and bolting to go catch a ball, this is where I would use this mode. Um, and we add the examples here of like race cars or motocross, things like that. And you can still come in and customize these even more. Like if you want it to be a little more responsive or a little less responsive, you have a whole bunch of, of settings available here as well. So with the focusing system, I know a lot of people are, are commenting about it, that it's our DFD system anymore. I'm not here to convince anybody one way or another. What I am here to say is take a look at it. Um, look at how much customization is available in the system to the different styles of shooting and know that the vast majority of people are going to want to play around with the system in their own. Most cameras, even the other ones out there that we get compared to often, also have levels of customization like this. It's not necessarily a new thing. Um, so play around with it. When the cameras start showing up in stores where you can get your hands on them, I highly suggest going in and playing around with it, bring a card if the store lets you, and actually start looking and diving into what this camera offers you because continuous autofocus is not just as simple as turning it on or off with some of our cameras. So let's see here. Some of the other questions that came through. And Wow, it's already quarter after 12, so I've got a little bit longer that I can run if everyone's enjoying the conversation uh, before I would want to call this. Uh, FC says, just curious, is single area now... Oh, wait, that was a question I answered before. Yeah. Um, Nick says, do the AF settings assume you're panning with the moving subject? Are you bird in flight, or is the camera still in movement? So that's what the AF, pr the motion prediction or the path prediction is set up for. It's basically... It, it compensates one way or another when you're moving. Um, I've done a lot of this playing around with, with the dog playing catch, uh, and it's been, it's been solid when I've gone through. Um, am I here to tell you that you're going to get 100% perfect results? No, I don't think any camera is ever going to give you 100% perfect results. But when you start playing with the system a little bit and you start understanding how the technologies work, I think you will get some amazing results out of this camera. Um, it is just so much fun to work with. So, uh, let's see here. Uh, stream live asks, can we know when the GH6 will be delivered worldwide? I believe all regions typically should be around the end of March. Obviously it's going to depend on, you know, shipping and all that other kind of fun stuff that this world's dealing with. Um, but I know that we're at least here in the U S it should be by the end of March, uh, availability. And I think most other regions are about the same time as well. Um, check with the retailer that you're pre-ordering through, um, if you're pre-ordering, uh, and they should be able to get you an idea of when you should see your camera and how early you are on the list. Um, let's see here. Cliff says, thank you for doing these live series. I don't see other companies doing it the way you do. Well, thank you, Cliff. Uh, yeah, it, it, these things are so much fun. You know, being able to get questions from everybody, I know that not all the questions are easy for us to answer. Um, and Matt and I both do the best we can at answering pretty much anything that you guys want to know. Um, our management, both here in Japan, are super supportive of, of this platform. 
So I think it speaks volumes as to the level that our team wants to be hearing the feedback from all of you. Uh, it is definitely a, a, a super fun uh, time to be working in a camera business. So um, let's see here. Uh, last one I was asking, how is the GH6 handle Olympus flash? Still not allowing burst modes. Yeah, so burst modes, if you want to shoot burst modes with flash, you do need to use a Lumix flash with that. Um, I don't know the 100% reason behind it, other than I know that the uh, duration and the cycling on our flashes is tuned to work with our system. Um, so yeah, you do have to use our flash with it for burst shooting. Otherwise, the flashes will all work for one frame. Um, let's see here. Some of the other, I, I know I'm forgetting something that I wanted to talk about with the photography side as well. Um, yes, now I remember what I wanted to talk about. Sorry. So, <clears throat> as everyone is probably aware, the GH6 has a cooling fan on it. It is an actively cooled camera to make sure that everything stays cool and functions primarily for the video side because we're pushing i mean in the video side you push up to 1.9 gigabits per second in prores hq that's insane but it also has benefits in the photography side as well a cooler camera produces cleaner looking images across the board uh, whether you're using the camera in a warm environment or you're shooting things for say astrophotography or night sky photography you want a camera that's cool and whether that heat is generated from the sensor, from the processor, from the memory card that's being used, you want to be able to keep the camera as cool as possible. There's a reason why, and I'm not saying that this is to the same level, but there's a reason why Astro-specific cameras are typically customized with their own active cooling systems built into them. If you speak to anyone that does uh, like diehard astrophotography, you know that they'll buy cameras that have thousands of dollars worth of additional cooling added to them to keep that sensor as cold as possible or as cool as possible. What I have found in my little experience of shooting in, you know, night sky shooting, where maybe you're doing really long exposures with tracking, so you have external solutions, this camera allows you to be able to have the built-in fan that will also aid in keeping the internals cool for photographers. Now, the best part about it is that just because we have an active cooling system on this, you're not giving up the weather resistance that we provide in the GH series cameras or even the S1H at all. The cooling system is on the outside and it's done through a heat exchanger for the Venus engine and the CF Express cards. Anyone that's used CF Express cards, you know that they get really warm. Um, that's just inherent with the, the type of media. So the system will keep the internals incredibly cool. The sensors cooled off through the actual chassis of the camera. So you have thermal management being handled in multi multiple different ways, both of which have zero impact on the actual weather resistant nature of this camera. So you still have dust splash and freeze resistant. It's down to negative 10 degrees centigrade. It's rated up to about 40 degrees centigrade for the hot side of the market. It's, it's one of those things that I know as a photographer, it may be a little jarring to think, oh, the camera's got a fan on it. Is that really what I want? From a usability perspective, it has zero impact in the end use of the camera. Yes, it adds a little bit of bulk to the back, but you also get that tri-tilt, or the, it's not tri-tilt, you get the tilt and fully vary angle screen on this camera, so it's the same one as the S1H, just a little bit easier because it doesn't have the lock on it. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> wow. So you get a much more reliable tool for all environments that you want to shoot in. Um, and the best part is, as far as photography goes, it can be turned off. You don't have to use it. Uh, and it has different modes. If you're shooting at night or, or it's a really, really hot day and you want to make sure you're keeping all the thermals as cool as possible, you can crank the fan to be full power if you want. Uh, or you can have it set into auto too, which is how it ships, where it'll turn off when it doesn't need it. And then it'll turn on as the thermals grow. It'll turn a fan on and ramp its speed up as it needs. Um, but let's see here. Uh, Marlene, thanks for, for joining it. Thank you for the kind words. Uh, Andreas, I think I'm pronouncing that right. I apologize if I mispronounce people's names. I, I don't mean it. 
Um, could the fan and cooling system become an issue in environments like uh, desert, sand, or rainforest water? Um, I, I, honestly, probably not. Um, what you have to remember is that we are Panasonic. Lumix is part of Panasonic. We Those that know what Panasonic does across the board for other areas that we build products for know that we have a lot of experience in building devices that need to be able to stay weather-resistant or even in some cases weather-proof. There is a distinction between the two. Um, while having active cooling solutions, we have an entire division that makes tough books and tough tablets for very severe environments that are designed with fan mechanisms and cooling designs that are designed to be taking environments like sand and rain and dust and stuff like that. Um, the fan that's built into this camera is no exception. Uh, anyone that works with laptops or even desktop computers, I mean, I got two of them running here. We all know that if you're looking at, say, a desktop computer with the fans that are built into here, there's multiple different technologies that are designed and styles of fans that are used, you know, between, um, I'm horrible with the names of them, but you have, uh, maglev fans, you have, you know, the, the captive oil fans and stuff like that. The system's designed and it's been tested. Uh, it's been deployed on the S1H since that camera launched and there's not been any issues with it. So uh, truthfully, I would not be worried about it. Um, but in ultra severe environments, like if I went out into the middle of the desert, if I went to, at least here in the US, if I went to the sand dunes out in Colorado, or if I went to White Sands and was photographing out there, um, I, I would be perfectly fine shooting with the camera. My own personal experience of the way I shoot normally is I'd probably still have some sort of cover on the outside of my camera, one of those little like plastic things with the tie. Um, but that's because I came up in the industry shooting with film cameras where you needed to be that careful. Um, the modern camera shouldn't really have a problem. When it comes to rain, um, yeah, I, I have no issues going outside if it's raining or, or snowing and shooting these cameras. There's not really a problem. Mainly because the way you're holding the camera, precipitation is going to be coming down typically. It's not going sideways into where the vents are. Uh, the intake vent is on the grip side so cool air gets pulled into that way uh and it's primarily behind it's got the proper clearance but it's behind where the screen is the output is on the port side so your warm air gets pushed out through the other side so yeah you really shouldn't have too much of a problem um let's see here some of the other questions um I think the GH6 is shorter than the GH5 in the width dimension. Uh, it is shorter in one of the dimensions. I think it's the height dimension. It might actually be just like, or no, maybe it is the width dimension. They're fairly similar, but let's let's be real here. The GH6 has a deeper uh, area from the lens mount to the rear mount here. Um, let's see here. I got time for two more questions and then I'm going to call it because we're, we're at 22 minutes over what we normally do. Um, so, uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. uh he says pre-ordered the GH6. Will it have B-RAW support? Um, I don't have any information on B-RAW support, uh, and we're going to talk about the video functionality next Thursday at 2 PM. So we'll have an entire stream just about the video functionality next week. Uh, one of the other questions was why the GH6 didn't come with an L mount instead of micro four thirds. Theoretically, I mean, uh, well, L mount is a full frame standard. Uh, that's our S series cameras. Micro four thirds is the MFT mount. Uh, if you put an L mount on a camera like this, you'd have only L mounts that could be adapted, L mount lenses that could be adapted to it. And the flange distances are different. Uh, this is a micro four thirds camera with a four thirds type sensor. So it's a micro four thirds mount camera. Uh, Bill asks, what is the bit depth of the still images and raw files? So there's 16 bit containers. Um, McMedia and film. I think I got that right. GH six for stills or G nine. If I were to go out and buy a camera today, um, I am one of the, one of those people that 
doesn't really care what the future is going to bring as far as technology because I have needs now. I have photographic needs and video needs now. If you're looking for a camera right now, don't wait. Waiting for cameras to come is a, is a perpetual cycle of always waiting for the next thing to come. Um, the GH6 is available now, and it is a powerhouse of stills for those that want a stills micro four thirds camera. The added benefit of all the video functionality in it isn't going to impact any of your stills usage day, to, day in and day out. Yes, it's there. Yes, in some ways, I know that some people think the, the logic of, well, it's there and I don't want to pay for it, so I want a cheaper camera like the G9 and have don't have those features. That's not how it works. Um, the cameras have the ability to do it. All of them do. So if it's not in there, you're still paying for something that's just not there. Um, the GH6 as a stills camera, if you're looking between the GH6 and a G9, if you look at a G9, you have faster burst rates with that camera. You have a slightly higher resolution viewfinder. Um, the grip is a little different between them, but personally, I think the grip on the GH6 is much better and it's more comfortable. I think the button layout on the GH6 is nicer. I like the rear screen design better, so that tilt when I want to keep everything in line with the focal plane. Um, it has fully articulating for those that like that as well, so it's really designed to kind of capture best of both worlds. Um, image quality wise, hand down, hands down, GH5, uh, GH6 miles above what the G9 was and the GH5 are. Um, I think the new pro the new sensor and the new Venus engine are just delivering miles above better quality of what existing 20 megapixel sensors can produce. Um, the tonality you get out of the image, the heft of the files that you can work with is just, it's, it's mind blowing. As we get closer and more, uh, samples can, are out there where you can actually edit the raw files yourselves, you'll see what I mean. Um, so right now it's a little bit of, you know, take my word for it, which I fully understand. I work for the brand. I know that that's a hard thing to do, but honestly, like I said, if you're looking to buy a camera right now and you want a new camera, I, I can't think of a better way to go if you're looking in the Lumix system than the G, GH6, um, Whatever cameras come in the future, that's something you deal with at that time when things come out. Um, but the GH6 is going to be a solid camera for photographers. And this is not even talking about the fact that all of us, whether we want to or not, video is becoming a more important thing. And if you're someone who has constantly said, and I was like this for years, I'm never going to use video. I don't care about it. Um, having it in a camera is such an amazing thing for the times when you do want it. When you don't want to have to carry around a camcorder or use your phone for video. Having something that can shoot the ridiculous high quality is, is a solid option. Um, yeah, so I, that's, that's my two cents. Um, I hope it's not, it's not too overbearing the way I explained it. But yeah, it, I've just had so much fun shooting with this camera and I hope that some of the stuff that I talked about today um, is inspiring to some people that the technology in Micro Four Thirds is still pushing forward. Um, and, and this is not, this is in no way the end of anything with Micro Four Thirds. We're just getting started. This new sensor, the new processor, um, the future is going to be so much fun with our system across the board in full frame and in Micro Four Thirds. They are here to stay and I am so excited about what we've where, where the next stages are going to go. So with that, um, I do have to end this now. We've gone a half hour over what our normal streams are. I'm so, so thankful for all of you in the chat, for all the questions and all the comments you've had back and forth. I know I wasn't able to get to every single one of the questions here, but I am so, so appreciative of everyone's uh, participation in this. This is so much fun for me to do. This is the highlight of my week every single week. Um, and we're going to be back next Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time as well. We're going to be talking about the video side of this camera. So if you enjoyed what you got out of this and you have some questions about the video side, or even if you're just interested in, you know, what is it with all this video stuff? If you've never looked at it, come join us. We do these every single week. They're always interactive. We always have, you know, such an amazing community that has such awesome questions and answers here. Um, 
yeah, it's just so much fun. So thank you all so much for joining me. Thank you for the questions here. Join us next week, Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and if you haven't already, I would greatly appreci appreciate if you like and subscribe to our channel. It lets me do more and more of these things. And yeah, outside of that, again, I can't say thank you enough. And I'm horrible at ending these streams. But thank you, everybody. I hope you have an amazing rest of your day. And I hope you all just get out there and go photograph some cool stuff and share it with the world. So take care, everybody. Thank you again.